Well, I want to welcome all of you today. I'm very excited about our program as we today are going to be talking about faith and science. You know, so oftentimes we think that the two have got to be separate. It's either, either you have faith or you trust or believe in, in, in science. It's almost like you can't, you can't have both. And I've heard that, you know, so many times. And part of the frustration that I think as we look throughout history is that the church is part of the problem, is that as you have people like uh, Copernicus and Galileo, as they're coming up with, you know, some of their scientific understandings, that the response of the church has been just simply to condemn them for, for it. And so that's a lot of what this is about, to see that you can have faith and also uh, believe in, in science or, or to study science. And so today I'm very excited because who we have as our guest is Dr. Willard Polkabrek. He is a science, he's been a professor of science, but he also is a person who is very strong in his faith. And I think you're going to really enjoy uh, hearing from him and, and enjoy this interview that we have today. I think you'll be very, I think you'll find this to be uh, very rewarding today. And so at this time, I want to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Willard Polkabrek. Yeah, good to have you with us today. I'm glad to be here. And I should just mention that he uh, has been a professor at the University of Wisconsin Platteville. Uh, he now is emeritus and that he retired a few years ago. And so the first, uh, maybe the first thing we should ask of you is uh, your background. Where did you grow up? I was born in St. Paul, Minnesota um, many years ago. I grew up in through the school system in St. Paul and lived there until I got uh, old enough and I went in the Army and that's when I left that area. That's right. You had a time in the Army and, uh, and didn't you go to Korea? Is that yeah, I spent a couple of years in Korea and then I went back to St. Paul area and went to the University of Minnesota, which is in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. um, and I spent several years at, at the University of Minnesota then. I, um, then uh, I got a, my first teaching job was at the U.S. Naval Academy uh, back in the 1960s. And uh, after that, I went back to the University of Minnesota and finished up my degree uh, getting my doctorate. And, um, and then I worked for a 3M company in, in the Twin Cities for uh, 11 years. And then I uh, got my position at the University of Wisconsin in Platteville, Wisconsin. Yeah, so that's quite a, quite a history that you've had, uh, quite a, a lot of different experiences as far as uh, you know, teaching at the, the academy, that must have been really something, but then also then working at 3M. And how many years uh, were you a professor at the University of Platteville? Uh, 25 years. Uh, 25 years? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, oh, very good. A couple summers I worked in Madison at the University in Madison. Okay. So, yeah. And one of the things that I should uh, mention is that Dr. Polkabrek, has written a textbook in his field. A textbook that, well, it's being used in universities throughout the world. How many different languages would you say your textbook is, is in right now? Well, I, I know of, let's see, I have four, I guess, uh, English, um, Thai language, Korean language, uh, 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 Persian language. Uh, that's Isn't the that one I'm aware the, of. Yeah, uh, that's really something. And so you, so you have this textbook. And, and what, do you, what what is the subject matter of this textbook? Well, uh, my dad was an auto mechanic, and he ran his uh, auto repair shop, and I grew up in that environment. And my degrees are in mechanical engineering and automotive engineering, and the textbook is uh, automotive engineering. Mm -hmm. Uh, about internal combustion engine, and uh, that's, uh, uh, but my background, uh, my father, uh, is the, influenced me into that direction. Mm -hmm. Well, Willard is a member of the church that I serve in Platteville, Wisconsin, and 
And I just want to say that he's very faithful as a member of the church. And I'm just always amazed that you know, not only does he come to worship every Sunday, but he also attends Bible studies. And it's always very interesting to get his perspective sometimes when he starts uh, talking a little bit about, about science. And I know there was one Bible study where we had another scientist who was also attending the Bible study. And we got talking about it. I don't know, we're studying the book of Job. And, and we got starting to talk about thunder and lightning. And that's where Willard and this other scientist started mentioning about how lightning and thunder, they happen simul simultaneously, but, but yet we see the lightning first and then the thunder later, and then they started talking about why that is, and then they got into all of these formulas. And those two, I mean, they were smiling from ear to ear as they were talking about these scientific formulas, and I'm just kind of like, huh? But nevertheless, I thought that it was very interesting. But why don't you just share a little bit about that thunder and lightning? Now, why, why is it that when... <laughs> The thunder and lightning, we always see the, the, the lightning, and sometimes I know if you count a certain, to a certain number, then that's how, many, how far off the, the thunder is, but explain that a little bit, not well, that you have to uh, go into all the formulas and stuff. First but. of all, the speed of light uh, is 187,000 miles per second, <laughs> which is almost instantaneous. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so when thunder and lightning occur, you see it right now, uh, even if it's miles away, uh, because of the speed of light. Uh, on the other hand, speed of sound comes through the air and travels at about uh, 1,100 uh, feet per second. Feet per second. Wow. Uh, so if uh, this occur occurrence occurs a mile away, it, it takes about five seconds to reach us, the sound. Mm -hmm. So light does it you get instantaneously, but uh, it takes uh, five seconds for each mile mm -hmm. away you are. And, and so if you count seconds, mm -hmm. um, if uh, uh, the lightning and occurs and you count 10 seconds before the sound hit comes to you, you're two miles from where that lightning hit. Isn't that something? That's really, that's so fascinating. But when you think about just how fast uh, light travels, and, th and sound travels awfully fast too when you think about it, but it almost sounds like you got the, the tortoise and the hare kind of a thing here, is that? Mm -hmm. But yet, you know, sound does travel awfully fast as you uh, shared the formula of that. And, and so that's all fascinating. And, you know, something else, you know, I think of, you know, once in a while, you know, I will, you know, I've had, you know, quite a background in Bible and theology, philosophy, psychology. And so once in a while I hear you know, somebody of faith talk about something I find, wow, that's so interesting. Like, for instance, the laws of thermodynamics. You know, I, I find that to be so fascinating to hear people talk about that. And, and I don't know, would you want to just share a little bit about um, thermodynamics as far as, you know, how many laws of thermodynamics are there? Uh, there are three laws, uh, two uh, made major laws, and then there's one minor uh, third law of thermodynamics. Um, my, I say my, my field is mechanical engineering, but that covers a broad area, and my specialty is in thermodynamics and heat transfer and fluid mechanics and, and that part of mechanical engineering. And uh, one of the things that we study are, are the laws of thermodynamics. The, first law, the second law, and then the third law. Um, I think all scientists and all anybody in technology accepts the laws of thermodynamics. They're, they're uh, basic uh, uh, premises that we live with in technology, and, and I don't think anybody questions the uh, realistic uh, 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 truth to them. Um, and it's interesting, though, uh, one form of the second law of thermodynamics is, is the concept of entropy, E-N-T-R-O-P-Y. Okay. Um, and, and if you look that up in the dictionary, uh, entropy means uh, disorder or randomness, uh, lack of order. Uh, and um, 
uh, the concept of second law says that uh, no matter what happens in the world, any movement, uh, the one concept of that is the increases of entropy, the disorder. And in, uh, I, I could give you a few examples that I used to use in, when I was teaching. Uh, you take two gases uh, which are separated. Well, you got some kind of order. You got gas A and gas B. Well, if you let them come together, they're spontaneously going to mix. And what you had order before, now you, they're disordered. They're combined. Uh, that's a very simple one. Uh, a, more, a little more elaborate one was uh, the concept of putting an ice cube into a cup of hot coffee. Okay. And I used to use this in my teaching. Uh, when you start with, you have an ice cube. Uh, so you have a solid, it's cold, and it's pure water. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have coffee, which is hot, liquid, and um, uh, a fluid that is not pure water. So you have, uh, uh, again, order. Well, if you put the ice cube in the, mm -hmm. in the coffee, uh, it spontaneously will mix, and you end up with warm coffee diluted with a little bit of water. Uh, while well, you've lost the order, you, where you had, you had solid liquid, now you just got a mixture. Uh, when you had hot and cold, now you just got mm -hmm. mixed together warm. Uh, and, and, and so uh, uh, you, you could take this coffee and wait forever to expect it to go back the other way. Mm -hmm. it, just, it goes in one direction only. Uh, same with the gases. Nowhere would the gases ever mm -hmm. uh, 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 become unmixed. Uh, you could take this coffee and with a lot of work uh, distill it, uh, take water out of it, put it back in the freezer, but it wouldn't spontaneously. It would take a lot of effort to change that. Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, so it's accepted that everything that happens uh, is you have this increase in disorder in the universe. Uh, well, I used to challenge my students um, to, uh, if, if everything is going to disorder, where did it all start? Uh, if you go backwards in time, uh, when did everything get put in order? Well, if you go back far enough, they uh, claim that the Big Bang Theory was the start of everything. Well, I don't pretend to know all about the Big Bang Theory, but a little bit I do know uh, seems to suggest it's kind of like a, you know, equate it to an explosion. Well, an explosion does not put things in order, it, mm -hmm. quite the contrary. So I challenge my students, uh, find a technical book, find an engineering book, uh, and there's lots of them around, find one that suggests where this order came from. And it came down that uh, the only book we could ever come and find was the Holy Bible. Uh, the first part of Genesis in the Holy Bible is the only book I know of uh, where uh, things are put into order to start with. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so here, to me, the Bible is filling in some uh, missing gaps in, in scientific information and knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I know when I s said this to my class, and, and uh, maybe I would have gotten in trouble if the state knew I was suggesting to read <laughs> the Bible, uh, but um, I had students laugh in my face when I suggested that. Uh, but more than that, I had students come to my office afterwards. Uh, uh, they didn't want to do it in front of their friends who thanked me for suggesting mm -hmm. this. And, and so uh, I, it was a positive experience. So what I find to be so amazing here is here we've got a scientist <coughs> who's been a professor for, for many years, who's taught many students. He's got a textbook that is being used by universities throughout the world, but yet uh, Dr. Polkabrek is one who believes in the Bible. And, and if anything, his studies in science have just strengthened his, his belief in the Bible as being the Word of God. And, and I must say that having Dr. Polkabrek in Bible class that he is one who is very firm. <laughs> He's very adamant to say that the Bible is the Word of God. And even though you know, he's a person of faith, but he certainly believes that the Bible is 
the Word of God, you know, through some very, uh, some, some deep understanding and conviction that he has had in, you know, not only the study of the Bible, but also, you know, his work in, as a scientist, as a science uh, professor. And so, as I think about, you know, the textbook, you know, the textbook that he wrote that's being used by so many students throughout the world, but yet, you know, we have the Bible as being the textbook of faith. And, and so Willard, I would be, uh, Dr. Polkerbeck here often, you know, I just refer to him as Willard, but he is certainly one that can, that can reconcile uh, between having faith and also uh, being being a scientist, and so I don't know what do you what do you think? You know, as far as being a writer of this famous textbook. Oh, and before I ask this question, I, be, I don't want to forget this. What's also amazing about um, Willard, Dr. Willard Polkabrek, is that he wrote another book. Now, this is not the textbook that he has that's being used in science classes throughout the world, but rather, this is a book that he wrote. It's entitled "Family Trees of the Bible." And maybe a little bit later on, we're going to talk a little bit more about this book. But I wanted to be sure uh, to mention this since he's a writer. But he went. It's, this is really quite a work. It's, it, yeah, this this book. It goes through all the genealogy of the Bible, as far as who's related to who. I just can't imagine how much time and how tedious this work uh, was for Wilder to do it. But it is a masterpiece. And if, and if you're looking, if you're a student of the Bible. And if you're looking for a tool or something to have in your library as you're studying the Bible, this book, Family Trees of the Bible, written by Willard Polkabrek, and you can uh, purchase this book on Amazon.com, or you can get it on, apparently, eBay as well. But we'll, we'll talk about the book in a, a little bit more. But I want to kind of say, uh, OK, you got the Bible, and you've got your textbook, and I I mean, is your, is your textbook something that's going to be probably used 100 years from now? No, it's interesting. Uh, when you write a book and put it on print and it mm -hmm. expose it to the world, uh, you better be pretty sure that it's truthful and accurate. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I put a major effort into, uh, and I think uh, my book is a, a good technical textbook. Mm -hmm. However, it is becoming slowly obsolete because of new technologies. Um, what was truthful uh, 15 years ago and uh, 10 years ago is not, uh, it's being challenged now. Uh, it, it, the book is about automobile engines and, and now uh, hybrid cars are appearing and more electronics are appearing. Mm -hmm. And um, the book will slowly uh, go out of uh, vogue by, because it, the technology is changing. So what is truthful now and, and when I wrote the book will not be totally, it won't be dishonest, but it will be uh, mm -hmm. dated and, and, and no longer uh, totally true. Uh, what amazes me is the Bible, which has been around uh, various parts of it for several thousand years, uh, I have not found anything that was not truthful in there yet, and, and not only truthful, but uh, uh, fits into our family, uh, our uh, everyday life now, uh, even though uh, uh, Proverbs, which was written thousands of years ago, boy, it, it's still, a, a, to me, the Bible is, is the handbook to of how to live, and and, and it, everything is truthful as far as I can see, and uh, so um, it's amazing. Uh, I, I don't think you can find any other book uh, ever written that is totally uh, in uh, uh, up to date after a hundred or two hundred years, and here we got one thousands of years old. These writings, and mm -hmm. and still, uh, I challenge anybody to show me. Or something in there that was not truthful. Yeah, so Dr. Polkabrek is making the argument to say that as he reads the Bible, that he can see that this is the truth, that the Bible is, you know, the textbook for life, and that even though it is 
parts of the Bible that was written thousands of years ago, well, all of it has been written at least 2,000 years ago, that it makes me think about a verse from Isaiah chapter 40, uh, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And so it was back in the 70s, I was in the 80s, I was studying science classes, what little science I had in high school and also in, in college. And so the very things that we were learning at the time uh, that were being taught as scientific fact, you know, what Dr. Paul Kubrick is saying here is that over time, because of technology and, and as science advances, is that some of the stuff that was taught to me as science fact back in the 70s and 80s has now become obsolete. But yet the Bible continues to be the word of God, that it's not obsolete, that it continues. But we could just maybe talk a little bit about, you know, as I visit with youth, like in the church or elsewhere, or just people in general, you know, a lot of them, they start reading, like, for instance, the creation stories, and they get all hung up. You know, like they will feel they go to Sunday school class, and the Sunday school teacher is teaching them that, well, everything was created in six days, and then God rested on the seventh day, whereas they go to science class, and, and they're learning that things are, you know, that God created things uh, over the course of, you know, six billion years. <laughs> And so, I don't know, what do you make of that? You know, as you look at, you know, as you're reading the Bible, I mean, it all seems so, you know, spelled out there, six days of creation, and then, and now all of a sudden you're hearing, well, it could have been, you know, billions and billions of years of creation. What would you say to that? What would you say to a young student saying, well, you know, it seems like it's either or, you know, how can I have faith? It's either I've got to believe the science teacher or my Sunday school teacher. What would you, what, what advice would you say to somebody like this, or you know, who knows, maybe there's somebody who's watching today that is feeling the same way? Well, I, I think of something that you said in one of our Bible discussion groups. Um, our God is big enough to create creation in six days if he wants to, but he's also big enough to create uh, the earth and the universe in, in a thousand years, and he's and if he wants, he could create uh, the universe and everything in a million years, a billion years. Mm -hmm. it's, it's up to God. We, we certainly, uh, the Bible is not enough that it teaches us all the little details of everything. You know, the book would be too big then. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it tells us the earth was created in six days. Uh, what does that mean? Is that a figurative? Is it a exact? Uh, there's two verses in the Bible that help me a whole lot. Uh, one's in Psalm 90 and the other one's in Second Peter, both are Old Testament and New Testament. It, it says a, a day is like a thousand years to God. Well, I, I, again, I'm not 100% sure exactly what that means, but it, it helps me a whole lot to, to uh, think of, of uh, things like creation. Uh, <clears throat> we, we live in a time period that we understand uh, minutes, seconds, years. Uh, but uh, there's other time periods, uh, astronomical uh, scale, uh, uh, geological scales that aren't in those kind of terms. And, and what is God's calendar? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we don't have all the details. Uh, my mother-in-law believed that the earth was made in six 24-hour periods. I, I guess personally, I don't believe that. I, uh, not that the Bible is, is uh, untrue there, uh, but uh, uh, what do we mean by a day? Uh, uh, it, it's uh, the third or fourth day when the sun was put into the, uh, according to the scripture. Uh, well, what was the day before the sun was there? A, a day now is, is a revolution mm -hmm. of the earth uh, mm -hmm. uh, relative to the sun. And, uh, so uh, uh, there's a few details missing there. That doesn't make it uh, not true. It's just that uh, our brains aren't big enough to comprehend everything. Mm -hmm. uh, can we uh, think of ourselves as, as capable of understanding creation, uh, mm -hmm. all the things that go on uh, to create what, what we live in? No, I, I don't think we're that smart. We're not capable of that. 
Yeah, so I think that, you know, kind of what you're saying is that, you know, that the Bible is a book of faith and that the Bible is maybe trying to answer maybe more the question of why creation rather than so much the how of it. And then when you get into science, we're dealing more with the blueprint or the, or the how of everything. You know, mm -hmm. so I, I guess we can be thankful for, for both and, and to say, well, God's time, I mean, God is eternal. God is infinite. And so we have to kind of think of it at that, too, is that maybe in some ways God is timeless or that time isn't like what, what we have, like uh, seconds and minutes and, and how we would have everything as far as a calendar. And it, but then also, you know, how about this question that I'll present to you as I think about what's written in Second uh, Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, where the Apostle Paul says that in Christ we are a new creation, the old has passed away, the new has come. And what that would suggest is the question, is God creating today? And is God creating you into that new creation, you know, as a person of Christ? Uh, what would you have to say to that? Uh, I, I, I certainly b believe that, yes. Uh, and uh, to me, uh, I have a, a, a new granddaughter who's a year old now, a little Anna, and to me, he's part of, she is part of God's creation. And uh, I, uh, to me, that's a miracle. A birth is a miracle and where they, all these molecules get put together in the mm -hmm. right order and, and you get a beautiful little girl. And mm -hmm. um, that's creation. Uh, uh, and creation is existing all the time mm -hmm. as, as, mm -hmm. as what I see. Yes. Well, here again, uh, Dr. Polkabrek, I just want to emphasize once again his book, uh, Family Trees of the Bible. You may not be wanting to go and buy his textbook. Well, who knows? Maybe you, you would be. But this is a book that I know that everybody of faith would really enjoy, his book on genealogy. Well, Dr. Polkabrek, just thank you so much for being on our show today, and God bless you. And well, thank you for and having me here. Your faith. Yeah. Uh, thank you for being my pastor. And thank you for joining us this day as well.